I want to do, introduce to you this, uh, this incredible magical hat. I, I call it the, the magic court hat. And uh, this is the, the rationalization that schools use whenever they want to you know, investigate and punish uh, you know, people accused of rape. Uh, and so what you may have heard whenever people advocate for the due process rights of students that, um, that those who support the current system in place will say, well, it's, it's not a legal proceeding. It's not a court of law. It's not a criminal trial. Therefore, students don't need you know, the level of protections that, you know, that that uh, those in those trials have, th those in those uh, situations have. Uh, of course, no one's advocating for those exact level of proceedings. Uh, but but in, on the other hand, when they want to act like a court of law, they'll say, well, we have an obligation to make campuses safe. You know, there's, there's an epidemic of crime, and we have to address that epidemic of crime. And we must encourage reporting of offenses at, at all costs, even if that cuts into the, the due process rights of, of the accused. <laughs> speaker has spent years uh, concocting conspiracy theories about how men and boys are discriminated against in education. Do not let his innocent, seemingly innocent face fool you. This man has a misogynistic streak a mile wide and merely hides his true agenda to make educating girls illegal <laughs> behind a preposterous ruse of compassion and concern for men and boys. So here to push his latest myths that some men accused of sexual assault on campus might not have done it and that due process actually exists for a reason, I give you Jonathan Taylor. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, good, good. <laughs> Well, thanks everyone for having me. Thanks to the uh, Honey Badgers for setting this up and for, uh, for having me here. Very excited to be here. So uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan Taylor. I'm the founder of Title IX for All. I've been um, working on education issues since about 2009. Uh, originally, I focused more on educational achievement issues, uh, but especially in the last uh, four or five years, I started to really focus on uh, misconduct issues, uh, due process issues for students who are accused of what are called Title IX related offenses. Uh, that would be things like, you know, sexual misconduct, dating violence, stalking, sexual exploitation, uh, and other, other types of, of offenses uh, for which uh, young men are being accused and uh, expelled uh, at, at quite an alarming rate from uh, higher education. Uh, so I, nowadays I, I run this platform with, with my wife, who unfortunately could not be here today. Her name is, is Samai Taylor, and I'm, I'm very happy with her, for her assistance. Uh, without her assistance, I could not, have, uh, could not be doing the, the level of work. Uh, we could not be doing the level of work that we're doing now, so I'm very, very grateful for that. And um, let's just, uh, that's just the front page of our website right there. Uh, a lot of our work that we do uh, recently is, is really focused on, on the legal arena, uh, there have been, as you've probably heard, many, many, many lawsuits filed against uh, higher ed institutions. Uh, we track those in a database that we have created from scratch. Uh, there's now roughly half a, a thousand uh, lawsuits that we've been tracking. Uh, and uh, we, we not only track those lawsuits, we include uh, tons of legal files. Uh, by the end of the year, we're on track to hit roughly 100,000 pages of legal files, uh, which is a big milestone for us that people can download and read, examine. <laughs> So uh, naturally, this would be a good resource for attorneys who are litigating these cases. Uh, several attorneys have emailed me saying, you know, thank you so much for this. Uh, it helped me file uh, my first Title IX lawsuit against a university. And uh, of course, it helps many, uh, many parents and many students who are uh, just trying to find out their legal options, trying to find out if there's an attorney who has a lot of experience. Uh, because of course, every attorney will tell you that they're great. But here, you can actually go in and look at their track record and, and see, see how they do. So. Uh, this is just uh, an example of, of our search engine where you can search for all the types of lawsuits that, we've, that we track. You can search them by, by state, by when they're filed, by which judicial circuit, uh, by which attorneys have litigated which cases, uh, things like that, by which, which claims are brought, whether it's like a Title IX claim or a due process claim, things like that. 
and it can get very granular uh, with, with the way you may want to search and sort uh, each, each uh, segment of data. So, so again, this is really good for attorneys and legal analysts and reporters and, and things like that. Hey you! Yes you! Watching this video! Did you miss out on going to the International Conference on Men's Issues? Or did you go and now you miss the fun times you had at this amazing event? Experience the magic of ICMI 2019 again or for the very first time with Honey Badger Radio's ICMI Disc Set. The Disc Set brings ICMI presentations together in one convenient package, as well as Disc Set exclusive Badger bonus content. Enjoy behind the scenes Badger interviews with free speech and men's issues luminaries like Sargon, Janice Fiamengo, and Count Dankula, as well as a never before seen Badger cartoon. Also available is sparkling ICMI merch such as our professionally designed program book, sticker sets, badges, and more. Go to feedthebadger.com and claim a piece of men's rights history for yourself. I want to talk briefly about the roots of the conflict. Um, one, of the, one of the first, uh, the conflict between due process and, and, and you know, survivors' rights, you know, accusers' rights, if you will. Uh, one of them is there's been, as you've probably heard, an, an unchallenged decades-long narrative that there's, there's an epidemic of rape on campus. A lot of this is backed up by studies which have, have very, <laughs> very uh, flexible, shall we say, uh, definitions of sexual misconduct uh, so uh, th that don't quite mirror the, the legal definitions of sexual misconduct. Uh, there's, if you look at the uh, studies that are done by advocates and the studies that are done by uh, like say the Department of Justice, the Department of Justice uh, study is, is wildly at odds uh, with the, the studies done by, by campus activists. Uh, the second is there's been a tradition of deference by the courts. Courts have tended to kind of let higher education officials do their own thing so long as they stay in their own lane. Uh, so long as the decision that they're rendering um, about whether to remove uh, a student from school is a genuinely academic uh, type of decision, They've generally kind of looked the other way and let schools do their own thing. Uh, but now they're, <laughs> they're obviously not making decisions about, about academic matters uh, in these cases. So, uh, so that is changing. Uh, there's also in our culture just a, a general, I'd say, desire to see male offenders punished or just you know, held responsible. Uh, many of you may have heard uh, you know, the, the phrase equal, equal pay for equal work. Um, you know, equal time for equal crime is, is another concept that has not really caught on in our society. And, uh, and of course, as a consequence, you know, men are 93% of those in our prison system. Uh, the notion of, of trickle-down privilege, that somehow the privilege just trickles down from the top, somehow it just didn't make its way to these, these guys in, in our society, or in, in prison. Uh, and, and of course, almost no women who are, <laughs> who, who, who are uh, falsely accusing people of rape are, are charged for their crimes either. So. Uh, there's also a, sort of a changing of the scope and of, of, the, of what the mission of higher education should be. When you think about what higher ed should be, it's, you, know, you would think that it would be about academics. Well, nowadays, education, it's, it's really kind of like an education resort where administrators are increasingly involving themselves in tons of, of social activities by, by students, and they sell their, their universities, uh, their enrollment, basically, on the notion of these, these great social activities. So, um, so there's, there's, and of course, the more you need that, the more you'll have more administrators, uh, and that goes links to another, uh, uh, another bullet down below. There's, there's been more and more what we call administrative bloat, just the, the incredible increase of administrators in higher education. Uh, in the last 25 years, the number of higher ed administrators has doubled. So you now have just tons of busybodies that are just looking for work to do. <laughs> um, and uh, last, uh, last, uh, lastly, there's uh, been the, the dominance of, of the feminist narrative in higher education, uh, which is, you know, that men are privileged. You know, you, you look at the top of society, take an inventory of the people there, and then based on that, you presume that all members of that class uh, are, are privileged, and, and uh, that's a fallacy called the apex fallacy, but it's also central to uh, feminist ideology. And then last but not least is, is the culmination of all of this, um, is the Dear Colleague letter issued in 2011 by the uh, Department of Education. Uh, this uh, basically mandated that all schools would have to uh, investigate every single sexual assault accusation that came their way. Uh, they would have to do so by a low standard of evidence, 
Uh, there, there was no, no, dis, no regard really to, to the due process rights of the accused, and, uh, and now we are seeing the results of this. <clears throat> uh, so for those of you who don't know, this is kind of the flow of, of, a, of a Title IX proceeding or a grievance process when, when an accuser, a female student in almost all cases, uh, she'll make the initial complaint, there'll be a preliminary investigation, uh, then there'll be, there should be, some notice given to the student who is accused, and then there's usually some kind of interim measures. For example, the school may issue, in, uh, institute a no-contact order, saying the male student cannot, uh, acu may, cannot contact the female student. Usually they'll make this mutual, but sometimes not. So the female student can, in some cases, attempt to contact the male student, and if he responds, well, you know, he's, you know, he's violated the no-contact order. Sometimes they'll go ahead and issue just an interim suspension, so the guy can't even set foot on campus, and uh, things like that. So uh, then there's the investigation. Usually someone prepares an investigative report or an investigative summary. And then uh, usually a panel of people, it, it could be, uh, could be ad administrators, could be a combination of administrators, faculty, and or students, uh, would then decide the, uh, the young man's fate. And very often these, uh, these panels are stacked with you know, sex assault victim advocates, you know, Title IX related professionals who, who really came up through their own ranks by advocating for women, women, women exclusively. And, um, and after that, there's a decision by, the, by the, the panel, or sometimes there'll just be a decision by one person. And then uh, after the decision, there is a potential appeal if the school allows it. Now, I want to do, introduce to you this, uh, this incredible magical hat. I, I call it the, the magic court hat. And uh, this is the, the rationalization that schools use whenever they want to you know, investigate and punish uh, you know, people accused of rape. Uh, and so what you may have heard whenever people advocate for the due process rights of students that, um, that those who support the current system in place will say, well, it's, it's not a legal proceeding. It's not a court of law. It's not a criminal trial. Therefore, students don't need, you know, the level of protections that, you know, that, that uh, those in those, trials ha th those, in those uh, situations have. Uh, of course, no one's advocating for those exact level of proceedings. Uh, but but in, on the other hand, when they want to act like a court of law, they'll say, well, we have an obligation to make campuses safe. You know, there's, there's an epidemic of crime, and we have to address that epidemic of crime. And we must encourage reporting of offenses at, at all costs, even if that cuts into the, the due process rights of, of the accused. And, um, and so they, they try to play both sides of this issue, but it doesn't really work. I'll give you an example. So when they say, now we're, now we're not like a court of law, they say, well, you know, they'll, they'll prosecute all charges, no matter how baseless. So, you know, in, in a normal you know, criminal, criminal justice setting, you know, you'd throw out baseless accusations. You'd say, well, you know, you can't, you know, you're probably not going to have much success with that, uh, with that type of charge based on the evidence. So, so you know, they just uh, decline to press charges. Um, the definitions of the crime, as we've noted, are, are more flexible in, in student uh, conduct proceedings. They don't have to be the exact same as, as the criminal code. Uh, the, in many of these uh, hearings, uh, the, the student's attorney, if, if he has one, uh, cannot speak, cannot address anything to, to the panel, uh, to, to anyone. Uh, they're, they're only allowed to, you know, whisper in the, in their, in the accused student's ear. Uh, there's, there's, it's an inquisitorial system, and it's not really an, an adversarial type of system. And uh, there's, you know, there's hearsay, so you can say, the accuser can say, well, the, my friend of my friend of my friend of my drug dealer's college cousin, roommate, whatever, supposedly heard this, that the accuser, accused student was guilty, therefore he is, and, and that would be permissible uh, in, in this type of setting. Uh, they, the school can, uh, can and often does pick and choose which witnesses they want to hear. They may hear only from the, the female, uh, the, the accuser's witnesses and, and not the males. Uh, and of course, cross-examination of the accuser is forbidden. And uh, if the accuser decides to just not show up for the hearing, um, then, then they'll just continue prosecuting effectively anyway. Um, whereas if you no-showed in, in an actual court of law, you know, that could adversely affect your case. So this is when they decide that they are like a court of law. Uh, now, now all of a sudden they are whenever they want to investigate and, uh, and uh, adjudicate felony, of felony offenses. You know, you would figure that rape is, is not misconduct. It, it's a felony. <laughs> it needs to be treated like a felony. Uh, so, 
So you would, you would think that you know, this is really in the purview of the criminal justice system. Uh, you know, the, the prosecutor is, is the institution, uh, not, not the accuser, just like you know, in, in criminal trials, the prosecution is effectively the state. Uh, university attorneys can take part in the proceedings. Uh, so the accuser's attorney, or the, the, the attorney of the accused cannot take part in the proceedings, but the attorneys for the school can. So that's, <laughs> that's how they work. Uh, the accused must raise timely objections. Uh, this is something that some schools uh, have, have gone into a court of law after they've been sued. And, the, and then, uh, for example, there was one case uh, called like Jacobson versus Blaze out of New York, where the the accused student had presented questions to the panel for the panel to ask of his accuser. And the panel did not ask the questions that he wanted to ask of the accuser, which would have exposed the, the you know, John Doe believes that, that the accuser was lying. So the panel didn't ask the questions, and he couldn't remember all of the questions that he wanted him to ask. So, uh, so then he, he brought this up whenever he sued, uh, sued the university later on. And then the university's defense in the court of law was, well, that 20-year-old that student should have known, should have had the legal wisdom to raise timely objections, or, or perhaps even if he didn't know to raise an objection, to raise an exception to address his, his timely objection that was refused. So for attorneys to walk into a court of law demanding that this 20-year-old kid, basically, should have the knowledge and wisdom of an attorney. <laughs> And, and to, to be able to effectively combat these, these university administrators who may have attorneys on staff on the panel <laughs> there in the hearing, that, that just doesn't make sense. And that's totally at odds with the rhetoric of, oh, we're not a court of law. We don't want to be like a court of law, this kind of thing. Um, and of course, if, if, the, uh, if the accused student is uh, no-shows, uh, he, he is uh, you know, he's often presumptively found, found guilty. Um, and that is like in a court of law. You know, if, if the uh, accused party does not show up, you, you know, the, the uh, prosecution would, uh, would you know, create a motion for default judgment against the accused. And if the judge thinks that it's a good idea, they'll go ahead and rule in the, in the prosecution's favor. Um, but, you know, not so here. You know, if, if you're, uh, well, I mean, uh, so here, you know, if, if the accused student doesn't show up, he's, he's presumed guilty. If the accuser does not show up, uh, then, then that does not uh, adversely affect her case. Uh, I want to give some examples of abuse. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because there's a ton. Uh, upon being sued, the school destroys the records of the investigation so that the court cannot look into uh, what they're doing. That was Doe versus Quinnipiac University. Uh, there's next one, the student. There's been several cases where students commit suicide after being wrongly found, uh, after being found guilty by the school administration. Uh, one of them, Clocky versus uh, UT Arlington, really doesn't get enough airtime because I believe in this case the, the person who brought uh, the, the claim against the university was in fact the father of the, of the accused student. And the father actually appealed this uh, twice to the, uh, to the Fifth Circuit Appellate Court. And then not only did he lose his case both times, but he was uh, forced to pay attorney's fees for the university. So he, he lost not only his son, but he, he had a devastating financial loss in that. Um, another one is uh, the accuser is not a student, but the school punishes the, the accused student anyway. That's Palo versus Iowa Board of Regents. Uh, the accused person uh, is not a student, but the school finds him guilty even though he's not attending the university. Now you might think, you know, what's, what's so bad if, if you know, this, this university way over there decides that this, that this accused student is guilty. Well, you know, in essence, if they just keep to themselves, that's not so bad a thing, although it kind of is. But, but this school actually went out and shared their findings of guilt with as many other <laughs> institutions as they could. And many of these other institutions will not allow you to enroll unless your existing record shows that you were in good standing. So they effectively went out to destroy this, this student's access to higher education. Uh, another example, whenever their uh, schools are making their credibility determinations, they may find the accuser more credible whenever she corrects herself, uh, but the accused student less credible whenever he corrects himself. That's uh, Doe versus Loy Loyola University, Chicago. Um, in Rom Romer versus Washington State University, uh, the, the student was, was not clearly ID'd. The, the, this was um, a case where she didn't even see the, the accuser, but she thought it might have been the guy based on some other you know, circumstantial evidence and reports. And the school didn't even know for sure, but you know, based on their system, they thought they did. So, <laughs> uh, 
the female student asks for sex in writing. Uh, the male student is still punished in Doe versus Occidental. This is one where, where she texts him. Uh, the student is suspended before the investigation, losing his housing, graduation, et cetera. Um, in, uh, in, a, in other cases, the student is expelled without any kind of, of hearing or any kind of any kind. And uh, I listed Caldwell versus Parker, but there's a more famous case called Doe versus Baum, which is uh, an appellate uh, ruling of the Sixth Circuit, uh, which really addresses this. Uh, this next one, Burmester versus Ainsley Carey et al. Uh, this is where the, the alleged victim is not the accuser, uh, and she denies she's a victim, and she's threatened by the school. Uh, for defending the, the accused. This is one where a California uh, school uh, had, had received a report uh, from a hearsay report, like third degree hearsay, that, uh, that he saw uh, uh, Matthew Bormeister roughhousing what, what he calls dating, what the, what the complainant called dating violence, but it just happened to be uh, both, both Matthew Bormeister and his girlfriend said that they were just, you know, horsing around, you know, roughhousing or whatever. Um, but, but the school decided to just go ahead and, um, you know, investigate and prosecute anyway. And uh, when, the, when his girlfriend decided to speak up in his behalf, uh, the, the school actually threatened uh, her with punishing her for, for in, uh, you know, getting in the middle of their investigation. So, uh, an immigrant studying on a student visa. Uh, he was found guilty, and uh, he, since he's here on a visa, he was uh, deported to his homeland. That's Doe versus Pennsylvania State University. And as it just turns out, this student was a Syrian student, and uh, some of you may be familiar that back in, you know, 2017, there was a little bit of a, a military uh, engagement going on in Syria. Uh, this student was forced to go back to his war-torn homeland in Syria. Um, there's a case in Doe versus Amherst where uh, both, both parties are drunk, but only the male student is punished because the, the female student is incapacitated. Um, this next one is the, uh, this is kind of an interesting one, where the, the male student is drunk and the female student is sober. Now in this case, they, they changed, uh, the male student changed uh, from vaginal to anal intercourse in the middle of their, their uh, in, in the middle of the event, and the, the female student did not like this. And whenever the male student complained that under the, the student conduct code, uh, she would have actually been raping him before then <laughs> because he was totally drunk uh, and wasted and she was not, uh, the, the female student made the claim that, that you know, it, it was, and he, the, the accused male student even said that he was too drunk to remember what had happened. Uh, and that was a lot of his defense. And the female uh, said that it doesn't matter whether he was too drunk to remember, uh, he should have known. And the school agreed and expelled him. Uh, next, next one is where the school decides to change the definition of sexual <laughs> misconduct in the middle of the investigation of the accused student and, uh, and find the student guilty based on this. This is a recent case, Doe versus Carleton College, uh, where they decided that the new definition of sexual assault uh, included uh, cases where if the male student cajoles or persuades the female student, uh, then that, is, uh, then that uh, invalidates her consent and therefore, uh, you know, He's committed sexual assault. <clears throat> this next one is mind-boggling. Um, there are several cases uh, where the student is not found guilty, They're not found guilty at all. But before the outcome of the investigation and the hearing, the school had uh, put a hold on his transcript so he couldn't graduate, he couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't go to uh, another school and transfer credits if he wanted to graduate somewhere else. There was a no-contact order and um, and of course, there's a mark on his record that, that there's an investigation. So the school finds him not guilty, but they don't clear his record. They don't lift the no contact order. They don't lift the interim suspension. And uh, they, you know, you might figure, oh, this is just a clerical error, right? Well, well, no, actually, uh, because you, and you learn that for sure when the school decides to fight these guys in court for 11 straight months and forcing them to pay attorneys' fees. Uh, just, just so that they can <laughs> clear the record of something that they weren't even found guilty of by the school. It's, it's kind of amazing that I, I can think of no other motive other than just, just belligerence uh, and malevolence by, by university administrators. Um, <clears throat> this, is, this next one's very common. Uh, schools, uh, you know, schools may pick and choose which, uh, which, which witnesses they want to hear. Um, another one is the schools will change the date of, of the hearing if they learn that there's a parallel criminal case and they can kind of game that to the system. There was uh, one of the Title IX investigators 
at this school, Appalachian State University, uh, believed that the accused uh, student was actually innocent, and she was going to make a statement at, at the criminal trial. Uh, but the school didn't want that evidence to be in play, so they went ahead and moved up the hearing, which was previously scheduled after this, this criminal, uh, criminal court event, to before and uh, to prevent her evidence from being in circulation, and then found him guilty and then expelled him. Uh, so um, in, uh, in Blaylor versus College of the Holy Cross, one of the panelists who decided the accused student's guilt was friends with the accuser. This was brought up before, uh, before the resolution of the investigation, and the school, uh, this was objected to, and the school refused to, um, to replace him. Um, and the next one, the fraternity support of the accused student uh, is characterized as plotting in Doe versus Rollins College, but if, if the sorority sisters support the, uh, the accuser, then that is characterized as supporting by the school's administration. I'm going to skip over this uh, for time. So how many students have been punished? Brett Sokolow is, is the uh, CEO of INCIRM, the National Center for Higher Education Risk Management. It's a legal and consulting firm. He estimates that somewhere around 20,000 since 2011 uh, have been punished. And uh, of course, that's an approximation. Um, there have been roughly half a thousand lawsuits that have been filed since that time. So that would put the rate at what, roughly one in 40 uh, uh, students uh, who are punished uh, have filed lawsuits, if, if the number is indeed 20,000. And uh, that number does seem roughly, roughly accurate, honestly. Um, another organization called FACE uh, has claimed that over 1,500 families have sought their help since their founding. That's in 2014. Uh, you know, take from that what you will. Uh, when plaintiffs are, uh, you know, filing a claim against these universities, you know, what are they really demanding? They're, they're demanding overall a process that is centered on truth. Uh, and, and really, I'd like to say something about truth and justice. It, truth is really the center, centerpiece of justice. Uh, you have to have a process centered on truth, because if, if you don't have truth, then, then you don't have justice. Any, any process that disregards truth will inevitably uh, disregard justice as well. So things like meaningful notice. You know, you have to give the accused student notice ahead of, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the proceedings. You know, you can't just, you know, ambush them <laughs> without, without giving them some sense of the, the, the actual charges they're accused of or the evidence being presented against them. Um, meaningful opportunity to be heard. A lot of students uh, w will say that they didn't, they didn't really have a chance to address the evidence uh, in the hearing. Uh, and a lot of the time this comes from them not being allowed to read the investigative report, uh, so they can't even see the extent of the evidence that was presented against them. Um, you know, no we don't want any conflicts among uh, decision makers. Uh, you know, people who are to decide the student's guilt should not have a conflict of interest. Um, and that's the same with the next bullet as well. Uh, you know, reasonable weighting and interpretations of evidence is another important thing. So if there's video evidence that exonerates, the, that is exculpatory for the accused, that should matter more than, you know, third or fourth or fifth degree hearsay. Uh, you know, that, that's some, you know, it, if, if you're clinging, if a school is clinging to the latter to, to kind of override the former, then, then it's clear that, uh, that the school is not really concerned with, with the, the impact of the evidence. Um, equal standards, you know, if, if this, you know, if the student conduct code applies to male students, it should, should apply to female students, and also an appropriate standard of evidence. It's interesting to see what plaintiffs are not demanding as well. Uh, the exact procedures of the criminal justice system, and this is something that is just brought up anytime uh, supporters of the current system um, uh, object to, to the current system, people will say, well, it's not a criminal trial. Well, no one is, is demanding the procedures of a criminal trial. No one is demanding, you know, sworn statements by the accuser with, with the threat of, you know, punishment for perjury. Uh, no one, you know, schools don't have the power, the subpoena powers, uh, and, and of course no one's demanding, you know, a beyond a reasonable doubt standard as well. Um, it's also interesting that, that people generally uh, are not demanding that schools punish you know, false accusers. Uh, it, although, you know, reasonably, I would think if they're in this business, then, then maybe they should, you know? I mean, maybe it should go both ways. Um, and uh, the last thing that, that people are not uh, claiming in their, in their lawsuits, and this is, again, something that, you know, maybe they should, is that higher ed should forgo entirely the role of investigating and adjudicating crimes. Investigating, I can kind of see that if, if, their, if their purpose is to funnel things over to law enforcement, uh, but, but pretending to, to be authorities in determining guilt or innocence in a rape case. You know, if, if, you're, if, if, um, if the criminal justice system 
you know, so often gets it wrong, as we've seen with men who are exonerated by DNA evidence 30 years later. Um, if the criminal justice, justice system gets it wrong so often, you know, I, I, you know, what makes school administrators think they can do any better, quite frankly? Universities have incredible advantages uh, in these lawsuits. Uh, money, money on top of money, including insurance. Um, so some of the things that, that most people don't ne necessarily um, think about it initially is that if there's a settlement, schools don't really pay uh, that settlement. It's actually the insurance company. They just pay the, the premium on that, uh, on that insurance policy. Uh, time. School uh, university administrators can wait out uh, the, uh, the plaintiffs uh, because the, the plaintiffs, you know, the, their, their career is disrupted and uh, a lot of the time they, they can't get back on track until the resolution of the lawsuit. And schools know that and so they, they can drag out the process. And uh, uh, attorneys, they have, they have attorneys that are dedicated for this kind of thing. Uh, you know, many of the, of the students don't have the money for an attorney uh, and, and so that, that's a huge factor as well. Uh, the appearance of legitimacy, though, though not necessarily the substance of legitimacy, through um, a Department of Education, what is called Office of Civil Rights Guidance, that's the Dear Colleague letter. Uh, some schools do refer to that, uh, or, excuse me, some courts do refer to that as, uh, as uh, uh, something that should inform uh, in, uh, student conduct proceedings, uh, and, um, and they, they give it too, too much uh, weight, I think. Uh, reputation and identity, and this, this goes both ways. Um, the accused, uh, the, the student who uh, brings a lawsuit against their school often files in the name of John Doe. Uh, in order to do this, they have to file a motion to proceed pseudonymously or anonymously. And uh, a lot of the time, the schools will uh, cont contest that and say, hey, the, the, you know, the plaintiff needs to you know, proceed under his real name. Well, the plaintiff may not want to proceed under his real name. Uh, you know, he, he may want to not have it, you know, incredibly public that, that he was accused of rape. And uh, there are some cases in which, you know, if, if, in a, if the plaintiff is forced to proceed under their real name, uh, that they will then drop the lawsuit uh, be, because of that, because they don't want their name public. Uh, as we've seen before, there's sometimes parallel criminal uh, litigation, which, uh, which some administrators can kind of game to the system. And uh, then there's, there's cultural momentum behind uh, behind what the university is doing as opposed to things like the rights of the accused. I'm going to skip over some of this and get to some of the good stuff. So, that, so some could say that there, there's a, the, these universities are ripe for reckoning, uh, and I want to get to some of the good news um, in context, and that is that there have been um, r roughly 70 percent of lawsuits filed against universities have seen some form, some form of positive outcome. And I want to really um, I want to really clarify what that means because you know what what you know, what, what is a victory and what, what is not. For example, um, in in most cases, more often than not, probably about 55 percent of cases, there's been a positive ruling for uh, for male students, uh, and then in in some cases there is you know not a positive ruling for the male student, but then the the male student still settles with the school. You know that that settlement could be a benefit for the uh, for the young man, uh, but that what does that do necessarily for the for the movement? Um, you know, not so much because you know the litigation movement really needs you know favorable rulings uh, in order to continue to gain traction. I'm going to spend just probably about another five minutes or so talking about some uh, some of the appellate uh, rulings. Um, there's been some rulings by now that have made their way all the way to federal appellate courts. Uh, some of these are listed here. Uh, a lot of these have to do with due process, uh, in particular the right to cross-examine the accused, uh, accuser, um, especially in cases where the accuser doesn't even show up to the hearing. And uh, you know, if in many of these cases, you know, it just come, it's just he said, she said. And when it's he said, she said, then there's a question of credibility. And if, if there's no physical evidence, then you really need to probe into, you know, why did you, you know, you know the, ask the accuser, you know, why did, why did you text, you know, the accused student, you know, a day after the supposed rape and say, oh, I had a great time last night, I can't wait to do it again. You know, why, why did you do that? Um, you, you need to be able to ask those questions. And if schools don't allow, uh, you know, the, the male students to to have someone ask those questions, and a lot of time it's not you know, it's not the male student asking the female students questions. It's it's asking through an intermediary like an advisor or forwarding the questions to the panel for the panel to ask of the um, of the complainant. 
And so, uh, yeah, there's several of these are here. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Dixon versus Keegan Ali, that's, that's another uh, California University case. This is a private university, uh, but it's interesting in this ruling, the, the judge ruled that the, the due process protections for a private university uh, under common law mirror the due process protections at a public university. So this, it's very interesting that the judge would rule that way in a, in a private university because when people think of constitutional protections like due process, they tend to think of public, you know, public universities. Uh, that would be more applicable to public universities. And Doe versus Purdue University is, um, I'm going to uh, finish up the, the talk of the appellate rulings here. Uh, this was an interesting case where um, it, it really shows in, in some sense the, the limits of, of the relief that can be granted by the courts. Uh, for example, uh, in this case, the, the federal appellate court uh, believed themselves, even stated in their ruling, that the, the hearing, uh, the process the university used was a sham. Uh, the, uh, the accuser uh, was not present for the hearing. Uh, she was investigated by a feminist rape advocate, rape counselor, you know, anti-rape advocate, and that um, and that person who, uh, who headed up like a sexual violence resource center at the school, she wrote a summary of the accuser's words and presented that summary to the panel. Two out of three members of the, of the university panel had not even read the report. Uh, the accused student had not read the report um, and he was provided the opportunity to read part of the report just a few minutes before the hearing. Um, and in that hearing he saw that the that the report had forged uh, a confession that he had made, uh, and he was, and he, <laughs> it's interesting, this is why you need to be able to read the evidence against you. Um, but um, despite this, uh, you know, he was, he was uh, found guilty based on no physical evidence and expelled, and so the, uh, the appellate court, uh, when they were reviewing this, they were, they were talking to the attorney uh, for the university, and they were saying, you know, this is, this is ultimately came down to a credibility contest in which, you know, the university not only did not even speak with Jane Doe, uh, they didn't even read words that Jane Doe had written. <laughs> they, they read the words as they were interpreted by this, uh, you know, rape crisis counselor effectively. So, what else do I have here? I'm going to skip over some of this and get to some, uh, some more juicy stuff. Um, a very recent development is that there uh, have been class action lawsuits uh, filed, uh, three of them. Uh, these are in the last 45 days. Uh, the impact of this is is very significant. Uh, if um, if any of these are successful, you know, it's, someone made a great analogy. It's it's like uh, recalling a uh, recalling a line of cars because there's a defect that can retroactively, uh, you know, basically recall the punishments of, of potentially hundreds of accused students. So there's three in play right now. Um, so that's one of the benefits is that it's retroactive. Uh, another thing is that the uh, it's especially useful for poor plaintiffs and, uh, you know, people who don't have a lot of money uh, and can't bring a lot of these lawsuits. Um, also, these things take to, tend to take quite a bit of time to get off the ground as well. So, um, and then there's, some of you may have heard that uh, Betsy DeVos, the, uh, the current, um, uh, you know, leader of the Department of Education, has proposed new, uh, new guidance, new guidance regulations on these issues. Uh, and uh, this, these regulations offer uh, much, much greater protections for the accused, uh, a higher standard of evidence, uh, cross-examination is no longer forbidden, uh, and it provides accommodations to both the accused student and the accused student. Uh, it, it requires meaningful notice of, of, the, of the charges. Uh, it, it forbids conflict of interest among decision makers. Uh, it requires that schools maintain records for three plus years, and uh, it also defines I skipped the first bullet. Uh, it, it also defines harassment more narrowly, um, uh, which, which some would say, and I would say, is the real definition of harassment. You know, it has to be severe, pa pervasive, and objectively offensive, based upon the uh, Davis versus Monroe Board of Education standard. You know, it, harassment is not, you know, that one thing that some guy did to annoy me that one time. You know, it's, it's not that. So it's, it's, it's a pattern of, of something that, that is so severe, per, uh, severe pervasive, and, and objectively offensive that it effectively denies someone equal access to education. So, um, so yeah, a lot of our work is, again, keeping track of this, uh, and uh, a lot of our work is talking to potential plaintiffs and attorneys uh, and reporters who wish to discuss these issues. Uh, if you want to check out more about it, uh, feel free to look at our website. And um, 
TitleLineForAll.com. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me today. Appreciate it. Okay, we went a little bit long there, but there is time for a couple of questions. We got about five minutes. I have more of a comment. Uh, my sure. name is uh, Brian. I'm an adult student at Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, you're so, this is so detailed and so accurate. I'm the only student at my school that has spoken out several times against the extreme feminists who then put me through this process. And this speaker's presentation is so accurate and so detailed, it literally might as well be at my school. I mean, I'm looking at this and it's just making me unbelievably angry just to even look at this because you're literally talking about my school. They've said I've created a hostile environment and this, that, and the other. When I refer to their kangaroo court, which is what this is, when you're talking about the appeal process, that's also made up by the feminists. The people that give you the trial are the feminists. Our, our student uh, code of conduct office mm -hmm. is handled by 100% females, which are all extreme feminists. Um, just this is so accurate and I'm living this right now uh, going through it uh, right now multiple times so his presentation is unbelievably accurate and it really is it's frightening because you literally are depicting what goes on at my school I just wanted to say that but thank you thank you <laughs> and, and best best wishes my question is about process of regulation could you just briefly tell us where those OCR regulations from Bessie DeVos are and what are the possibilities that they're actually going to become implemented? And then I have another question offline about change of administration and its potential impact on that process. Yeah, sure. So the proposed uh, regulations can be found on the Department of Education website. You can just, um, you can m probably more easily just you know, Google the proposed regulations. You can find them on our website too at TitleLineForAll.com. Um, and the likelihood of them being um, being a, instituted in some form, I, I would say is, is fairly high. Um, my concern is that Betsy DeVos may have, may have, the regulations are so extensive, they're far more extensive than anything we've seen before. Uh, my concern is that uh, DeVos may have bitten off more than she can chew necessarily because the broader the regulations are, uh, the more time that'll take to, to get instituted. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I think that we'll see something instituted like that uh, but I think it'll be, um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was, if they decided to kind of pare down uh, some of the regulations. So uh, the, the real benefit is that this will give greater force to lawsuits uh, against universities and that'll just increase the ramp up of, of that litigation. So. Hi, I'm curious what a student who has not been accused of anything can do to stay safe and protect himself and if any universities are better than others as far as upholding due process and civil rights? Some universities are definitely better than others. Some states are definitely better than others. California and New York and Massachusetts in particular are, uh, are particularly bad states for the accused. Um, what you can do is, you know, I, I wouldn't advocate uh, you know, being afraid to you know, talk with women or get together with women, but I would avoid uh, parties where there's a heavy amount of alcohol consumed. Uh, especially fraternity parties, because those are just, you know, those are in the spotlight for administrators. So just, yeah. Thank you. Morning. Um, I'm from the, uh, the UK, and I've got a teenage son. Um, and I've also seen in the press that uh, Cambridge University, for instance, is looking to change its, um, the evidence required in these kinds of cases. So I'm obviously concerned that we're heading down the an earlier point in what America has been doing. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's any advice that you can give on how I can perhaps start raising concerns and which area I could focus at to say, to show these universities, look, if you go down this route, mm -hmm. this is the potential consequence for you. Um, it's one of the things that concerns me, there was an open letter in Cambridge University that was signed by 800 students that are following the up, what, that want this change. and I seems like it's like Turkey's voting for Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's very, unfortunately, I think there's, there's very little that can be done if they decide to go down that path. I think that really uh, the best you can do is just continue to point out the, the inaccuracies behind the, uh, the, they'll almost certainly state that there's an epidemic of, of rape on college campuses and things like that. Uh, pointing out 
the deficiencies in those arguments is good. Uh, pointing out the bias among those who, who advocate you know, greater intervention by universities uh, is also good as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, ultimately, yeah, it, it's, it's a very difficult battle. So I, I wish I had better, a better answer for you. So. Thanks. But how retroactive would retroactive be? I, I was summarily dismissed in 1977 from the California School of Professional Psychology. Yeah, so um, I think the, the greater issue may be that with class action lawsuits, the plaintiffs have to be similarly situated plaintiffs. So that, that really addresses, I think, the core of your question. Um, it, it really depends upon, um, I, I would think, I, I, don't, I honestly don't know if they'll go back that far, but uh, it, it depends upon the nature of, of the proceedings that were used against you. There were none. Yeah. I don't yeah. even know who I would supposedly harm. Yeah, like, uh, like for example, uh, the, uh, the class action lawsuit against uh, Michigan State University uh, is based upon a ruling, uh, well, yeah, a, a ruling that came out in, in 2018. Um, and that, that hinges upon a lack of a hearing and a lack of cross-examination. So students who, who fit that situation may be similarly situated. Same thing with some California universities. So you, you uh, said, would I have to join the suit? Uh, yeah, you would have to join the suit. Uh, and, and yeah. I have a very brief comment on the question. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I was accused of sexual harassment, like, and this is like a direct quotation. He was manipulating my emotions and lying to me by telling me that he was not attracted to me. And I was sanctioned with counseling, like one-time counseling for this. But I'm actually one of the luckier ones. So the Boyermeister case actually happened at USC. So he was expelled from the school as a football player, uh, even though the girlfriend actually denied that any violence happened like multiple times. And I reviewed security footage, which like should establish to any reasonable person that he was innocent and he was still expelled. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that that's one messed up case. I agree. So. All right, all right. Shoot. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Everybody, Jonathan Taylor, amazing work, amazing work. Um, I do want to remind everybody, uh, before I forget, because I, uh, if I don't do it now.